Okay, it's uh, 4.30. It's a meeting of the Ulster Explaining Commission. Not at our regular time. Would like to call the roll, please, Judy? Indeed, Reed. Here. Stiles. Here. Jibuka. Here. Also present is uh, Village Planner Denise Swinger. We are expecting Jerry Sims. We are expecting Rose Pelzel. All right, thanks. Uh, we have an agenda here. Uh, anything that's come up that we need to add to this, or are we okay as is? Okay. Well, let's stand as it is then. Um, you know, I can't vote on the minutes, so there's no reason really to review them until we have three votes. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, we'll pass on that for now. Communications. We have the one additional piece of information from Montgomery uh, County regarding the uh, regulations or lack thereof with uh, the Airbnbs. Yeah. And next is council report. Um. Jerry is Jerry not being here. I do have one thing that came out of the council meeting um, as a result of the alleyways, um, the vacation of those right of ways. <clears throat> the council um, deliberated for a little bit about alleyways in general, and um, I told them that what they would like to do um, is look at alleyways as a possible future planning area for uh, walkways. And what do we currently have, rather than um, rather than uh, vacating uh, any of the thoroughfares? The through. So basically, I told them at this point we didn't really have an alleyway map. Um, Jason Hamby has taken a, uh, an address map that we have and has highlighted the ones that are currently being um, maintained by the village. Um, in this case. Uh, these, the two alleyways that we vacated really didn't have a <coughs> connecting. They didn't connect to some place, so I don't think that was an, was as much an issue for council. But I suggested that um, you know council's going to have to be looking at updating, maybe possibly January, February, March, focusing on a, an update to the comprehensive development plan because it's been six years, and um, perhaps we could look at alleyways as part of that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that, is there even a map of, there's not really a map of where, where those easements are. No, and so uh, trying to do that using the GIS that is provided by Green County is difficult. So Ken LeBlanc from Regional Planning and I talked about it and I said if there's any way, he said, oh, I can probably get you like 30 by 40 inches. It's something more that we could work at at a table. So he's going to try to create, have a staff create a map book. And if you go, like on the GIS, um, you can, under parcel dimensions, if you click that, it'll show you, like, whether it's an, a vacated alley or if it's an actual existing alley and how many feet wide it is. And that, um, plus you're getting an aerial shot where you're actually able to see if there's structures that are blocking it, whether it's trees or it's a barn or a shed or a garage. So they're going to do that for us. And he said it'd probably take a couple weeks. Okay. Um, May I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought that it was important that we figure out where are all the owls in the village and designate the ones, whether they're being used or not being used, if they're in a location that potentially would make sense as a walkway, even if they're not, and then say, you know, we're preserving the sort of make a list of the alleys that we are clear we want to preserve and then some of the, and there are going to be some that aren't or parts of the alleys right well i, I know in the past we vacated a couple of alley, alleys a couple of years ago but they were they were discontinuous they were like isolated in the middle of a block well, it was like, like one little piece. oh yeah exactly and right and like piece. the one that was vacated that, it, that you just well both of them the two that we just vacated, they had structures on them, and the people actually thought they were part of their property. Right. 
Judith and I actually went back and walked back around. <laughs> So some of those are just the lost yeah. spot. And I, but I know that's something that we always thought is kind of the first cut is, are they, did they extend up to a street or not? And if they did, then we always thought, oh no, we shouldn't have been using But even like I have an alley that comes between my house, I'm West Davis, and turns in my backyard and goes all the way between Davis and Whiteman. And I don't know whether the end got vacated on Phillips or not. I, I, too bad if it did, because it really is useful, and people mm -hmm. do use it, and they walk. And stuff. But, but so even though it doesn't go all the way through to uh, Phillips, it still is used, but, not, but it's not maintained at the village. Really, so, so, so. so you're going to start with an inventory. Wait. Is the village supposed to maintain alleys? Yes. Unless they're vacated. Well, it's just like, I mean, there are things in our parks that would be nice if they were maintained a little better. I mean, if we have a certain capacity and yeah. work out well. Yeah. Uh, you know, that being said, um, we're also responsible for maintaining sidewalks as a result of the ordinance some years yeah. back. And, you know, no, you know, you have to put money up for it in order yeah. for it to be done. And, but I think the sidewalks are, you know, actually on people's radar and the, you know, like, I don't know, that it's, that it is a responsibility of the village isn't on, you know, the radar of the people who are putting the money where it's going. Yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of the alleys that aren't necessarily maintained but are, you know, they, they are used by people. If they were maintained, then maybe more people would use them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else from council? No, I'm just going to go ahead though and put that comprehensive development plan and alleyway center into the planning for okay. the future. And I guess, Mary, since you're here, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about kind of the northwest corner of the village with the CBE and everything. Um, Kind of follow those discussions. I hope that you guys take an opportunity to do a comprehensive plan for the northwest corner of the village that includes CBE and Glass Farm and you know get our arms around that whole thing. So um, yeah, I was just talking to Karen today and she was suggesting that we do right, especially the yeah. university potentially yeah. leaving. I think there's actually a restriction on that property. It has to be used for education only. Yeah. So, but we you know, were we talking about uh, creating a community process for looking at that yeah. northwest border yeah. development on the northwest housing and commercial or whatever. Yeah. Okay. That's good. <clears throat> okay. So next on the list is public hearings. So we have three public hearings. Um, that talk about uh, really cleaning up some things in the code and maybe make some modifications. Continuing um, to clean up things. Well, yeah, yeah, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. The, um, the first one is uh, a modification to the application fee language in section 122401. Denise, do you want to? Sure. Um, when we were doing the right away vacation of the two alleys, um, I noticed um, that in uh, chapter 122401, um, under right-of-way vacation procedures, which is in the planning section, not the, the zoning section of the code, um, there was a, a fee in there that was not updated when the fee schedule was updated uh, in 2015. So this is simply putting that fee for the right-of-way application form uh, in line with the actual fee schedule. A question I have about that is, I guess, if it was approved to change it, why can't it just be changed in it? Why do we now need to? <clears throat> that was a question that we asked, um, the, actually, Judy asked American Legal. Uh, yeah, and they said, no, you, when it was passed, you passed it specific to these sections in which it was changed and left out, you omitted, correct, changing it in this one section, you have to go back in say it's okay to correct it in that section. You can't just assume that it, it has to be done. So right. next time we change 
waive something like that? Can we add in language that said, you know, if if uh, discrepancies are found in the code? Well, well, I went back through the code, at least the code that I deal with, and um, what this thirty-five dollars amount was the only place I noticed that was that was still showing that. As an amount, and and what it normally says, and what I'm suggesting, is as established by the village council. Yes. And then that then that takes you, that takes you over to the fee schedule. Yeah. Okay. And that was our goal. Just put yeah. everything in the fee schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, this is yes. This is just an oversight because again, this was the planning section and not the zoning section. But I under, I understand what you're saying, and that's a question we can throw back to. Um, the legal department when they write those ordinances. Because I mean, so, yeah, several yeah. other places we've had something that we change in one place and then it doesn't match up with something else and we have to go through this whole new whole system again. I mean, it seems seems redundant, right? It like it, it, you're right. And the zoning code is really unique in that there are these separate sections, all of which are interrelated. Yeah. And if you, and if you don't catch one, so. Uh, yeah, Denise and I can work on. I'll give her the minutes so she can pass that on to yeah. the legal department too. Yeah. And it's a lengthy process to have to go through anyway. Yeah. 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 And this and has, has to go through council. Advertise it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. expensive, really. Yeah. It is. You know, and you, you have to do all this work to you know to argue for it when there really doesn't need to be an argument for it. You know, like I mean, that's a good point. Definitely. It's practically a typo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are, you know, our brains aren't computers, so like, you, it's not, it's not anyone's fault that this was missed. It's just, you know, like, yeah. In for the discussion. If not, we'll open the public hearing. This is if you have any comments that Jay wants to say. Regarding this change in Chapter 1224, please step to the microphone and address the planning commission. If not, we'll close the public hearing. Was that too quick? You, you guys? <laughs> 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 uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, any further discussion? Uh, do we have a motion to uh, approve this? I move that we approve this change um, to the uh, right away vacation process. Of the fee. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I don't think you need to call the roll, did you? Okay, one down. <laughs> the uh, the second uh, hearing is a, um, a revision to section 1248, dimensional requirements for uh, setbacks in residential A. Uh, do you want to yes, um, this was uh, <clears throat> what is believed to be an error in the code that was um, discovered when a variant seeking relief from the side yard setback um, on Corey Street in Residential A um, came up with uh, property owners that are building a home. Um, in talking with, it had, it had to go before BZA, and BZA granted the variance, but at the same time, uh, what BZ, BZA said was um, several members were either on the, the technical review committee at the time or they were um, attended a lot of the meetings and they said this completely goes against what the purpose, the general thrust of the code was to, to allow for greater infill and density and um, this setback is just is really off the mark because, and even going back and doing some uh, research in the codes before, the setback prior, even all the way back into the 1980s, the side yard setback was in, in RA, which is low density, was 10 feet um, on this side um, and 10 feet on the other side minimum for a total of 20. Um, this, is, this goes from RC being 10 feet both sides to RB uh, 10, 5 feet on one side with uh, 15 total and then it jumps from from 10 to 15, it jumps to 25. So it should be 20, and that's what? 20 total. Mm -hmm. 10, 10 on both sides, you know. 
and, 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 and in one of the arguments that the property owners made was that pretty much everything over there, a lot of the properties in that area are going to be not conforming, are now not conforming as a result of this change because they were 20 feet before. Yeah. So. So the old code was 20 feet and it just got changed to 25 mm -hmm. when in the new code for mm -hmm. some unknown reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you make a change, like, I'm consultant. Okay. Okay, so, but, you, but the 15 foot for the RV is correct? Yes. Okay. okay. And that's, you know, a minimum of five on one side, but a total of 15 both sides, yeah. Yeah, okay. Any further discussion? So you're saying that the RA should be a total of 20? And both sides. And that's the, that's the minimum yeah. that we do in this table. Yes. Okay. All right. If there's no more discussion, then we'll open the public hearing. If you have anything to say about this revision to section 1248, please step forward. If not, we'll close the public hearing. Any further discussion? We have a motion to accept this change. I have a motion to accept the text amendment um, approving the change to the minimum setback on RA. So. Do we have a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now we get serious. The next one is the revision to uh, section 674, removal of plants and seeds. Okay, um, the ordinance restricting um, the village from notifying property owners until July, until after July 1st has been, has been uh, problematic for staff um, every season because people call and, and they're grass is overgrown and we can't really officially start to send out letters and notify property owners and somehow this morphed uh, at the council level. Um, Mary McQueen who is here I'm from council is also represented on the environmental commission and they thought this council thought would be a good time to let the environmental commission look at this and maybe just look at the whole chapter and review it and so all the representatives several representatives and two other representatives are here today from the Environmental Commission to explain in detail um, what they what changes they made in, in addition to this July 1st notification about mowing. So, so July 1st notification will do? It's been in the code. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Because of nesting. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, we have representatives here today from the government. No, I'm just trying to Just identify yourself for the folks on Channel 5. <laughs> I'm just Stuart Headlam, one of the environmental commissioners. And Nanny Malarkey, another member of the environmental commission. All right, so uh, we were asked to review um, the ordinance uh, specifically relative to the July 1st mow date, if you will. And in looking at that, the, our understanding that uh, that was in the ordinance because uh, to provide habitat for nesting animals, um, which in one way really doesn't make sense because generally nesting animals in lawns, they're somewhat mutually exclusive, but the intent was to provide habitat uh, wildlife habitat or consideration for that. And so uh, it was our conclusion that really a no modate really doesn't help with that because lawns per se are not really hospitable wildlife habitat. Um, in parallel with that, uh, we, we looked at what other communities were doing to enable um, people to have wildlife habitat um, on their property as well as um, to address some other things that the council was concerned about, um, such as increasing storm runoff and uh, uh, 
things along those lines. And so other communities are permitting um, uh, managed natural landscapes, um, which, and so we added a clause around managed natural landscapes. This is being done around the country. One of the Cincinnati, um, not necessarily the most liberal community, uh, has uh, managed natural uh, landscape ordinance. And then the final piece is uh, we looked at the uh, invasive component and realized that it was not in sync with the Ohio PNR and added, uh, updated that to be in sync with the Ohio PNR list of invasive species. Okay. Um, so essentially you're, you're going to remove the July 1st and, and just say that um, tall grass is tall grass and you have to cut it? No, it's or, clear. We've used a definition which is managed natural landscaping and yeah, we talk about yeah. a plan. But that's different than the July 1st yeah. you know, day for tall lines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. a planted grass. Yeah. You know, the, right. the definition of a managed natural landscape is you remove right. the lawn right. and you intentionally plant native species and you manage them so that there aren't weeds. Or animal. it's a forest. What's that? Or a forest, yeah. I mean, but that's native vegetation as well. Yeah, yeah, that's what being stupid. Yeah. But it's a, a way of also uh, appeasing those members in the community because they talk about everyone having different standards and what they aesthetically think are pleasing. Right. Right. So it's a way of really stating that people who are just letting things become pretty pestilent or you know you have creatures that some people might be concerned about um, and they're letting things go it, it's a way of saying well that doesn't mean that that's a managed natural landscape and if you're infiltrating the po poison ivy and you're just letting it grow that's still not, not part of it and we did feel that the um, the list looks pretty extensive and that's a small list from the Ohio <coughs> Department of Natural Resources one thing that we did put down here is such owners are strongly advised to consider um, an environmentally friendly management plan, but we, we don't want people to feel like they've all suddenly got to spend so much money to remove these things. So it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a method of raising awareness so that people can start to address. I can't keep the honeysuckle out of the it takes, it takes a lot of work. It I takes commitment. I have, I have a good honeysuckle popper if you ever need to borrow it. It's right in the backyard. <laughs> and there's different ways, you know. The thing is, you don't need planting it. So, right. I mean, some people right. might be still planting, right. you know, Tree of Heaven um, and some of the um, various other plants that are on here. So, and, and really it does tie into the village wanting us to look at a climate action plan because once you have more biodiverse landscapes, you're dealing with carbon sequestration, water retention. While you're here, can you address, is it next week? Yes. I got an email, can you, I don't know, at least folks all got that, so can you? So, um, next week there is, uh, on the 18th, on Tuesday at 5.45, which is the next regularly scheduled environmental commission meeting, um, the Village Council has asked the Environmental Commission to work with the Energy Board, other commissions, and the local experts to begin to craft a climate action plan. Um, and these specifically are the strategies and actions that the village government, as well as people within the village can take to lower our um, greenhouse gas emissions and to begin to build resilience to the impacts of climate change. So, you're all welcome. If you do plan to attend, please let me, Dewar Headley, or Marianne know, because there will be light snacks that we want to plan. Okay. Yeah. Okay, when is it again? Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. The 18th? Yes. At 545 in this room. One, one other key point relative to uh, the lawn ordinance and the managed natural landscape, um, it, you know, they still have to comply with all the setbacks and all the other requirements for visibility. I mean, it doesn't change any of that. And, um, and that's why we didn't put any other language in because it already exists elsewhere. Um, in the and one other issue is that when we were doing this review, we looked at what the trees were that were recommended by the tree committee, which are also listed. And I called Anna Belisari up. She says, oh, that I said, you're still recommending calorie pears. It's on the list, including amber maples, which are also not considered beneficial trees in any way. Um, so 
So, sh so at some point, we are going to get together with the tree committee to amend the list that is going to be much more um, environmentally savvy and makes sense for attracting pollinators and not bringing in invasive species. So, I mean, there's been such a growth of learning in the past 20 years as to what's been happening to the environment in, in terms of plants and supporting our, our native wildlife. Any questions for these guys here? So there is another ordinance that deals with lawn maintenance? There's a there's a uh, section, I believe it's in the planning section, for subdivisions, recommended trees, um, for like a, what that you might be planning on estate streets and that uh, that's what she's referring to. Mm -hmm. okay. Is how does the the managed natural landscaping that was intentionally how do you deal with the individuals then that just let their yard go? I mean, well, they have to mow within yeah. Yeah. Uh, what ten feet of the street side and five feet of the interior side of or rear lot line. But I think your question was so how do you deal with somebody area. that just lets their lawn yeah. grow? Yeah. That, that majority of this ordinance is not permitted. That's if you not have a lawn, lawn, you have to mow it. Well, you and don't have to mow all of it. You just have to, yeah. If, but if you have grass, you, have to, to the, you have to mow it. Yeah. And, that, and, and that is, if you want to have a managed natural landscape, you have to create a managed natural landscape. Or if you already have a natural landscape. Can you explain where it says if you have a lawn, you have to mow it? Um, number three, it yeah. was number two. Yeah, but where in the like exceeding a height of 12 inches? Yeah, but that's only for the five feet, 10 feet of the street. Well, I guess the question is, is that is, is a lawn considered a cultivated non green plant growth? Yes. But it's only within that amount of space. I mean, like, one could. Yeah, it's written. I don't think it says it. But, but also, not, such yeah. owner shall cause the following to be removed. Ragweed, mm -hmm. yeah. thistle, and poison ivy. So, um, I guess, like, my, my question. We need to have that. We need to have it in there. We have. We need yeah. to. Then something needs to be clarified in here because. Um, Wait. What? We we should have something about grass. Yeah. But this is about grass. It's it's it that. I understand it perfectly. Um, it's related. It's just. Right. I mean, like I and I agree with it. Um, I think that, like, what I'm saying is, you're not talking about. You have to mow your lawn. Right. You're talking about you have to mow yes. around your property yeah. line, right. which I think is legitimate, but it also doesn't address. You know, it says, uh, who if you violate 67, 674.03, that's a mis misdemeanor. But what happens if you? So we need to amend that. We need to make it six seven four zero oh, two. Do you, do you, as a commission, do you understand? I don't understand why you would have the edge of a property mode and not the rest. Because you can't. You can't. Why would? Why would you have the authority to regulate that? I mean, the 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 purpose of the zoning code, right, <coughs> is to provide sort of you know standards to which everyone conforms right. to a certain extent so that people aren't bothering their neighbors, right? A lot of communities that do have where they require uh, the surrounding communities, same yeah. year fairborn, yeah. where they require right. the whole lawn that you get. And it's like ten or twelve inches and if yeah. if not, then the city goes around and they put a notice on your property and they will either require you to mow it or they mow it and then they bill you for it. Yeah. And 
I, I mean, I don't agree that it needs to be more stringent than it is, but I do think that we need to, and I, and I think that the reason why someone would actually be worried about someone else's property being um, unmowed, right, even if it's more than just a lot, you know, around the perimeter, is the, like, noxious plants, ragweed, thistle, and poison ivy, because those things can creep on, so I do, I want there to be some clarity about what, you know, what, but, yeah. No, that's a good that's regard. a very excellent point, and that was a, a miss on our part, because we're, neither of us had lawns. Because the way I, I interpreted yeah. it differently, mm -hmm. because so we've always don't had that. Around, you don't yeah. have to mow around the edges but, of your property? I don't have but a that says uncultivated, non-woody plant growth, which is not grass, because right, grass is a cultivated, non-woody plant growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there needs to be there needs to be clarity because if you're not clear, then the public is not going to So at that point, yeah. we need to so I I would that. think that I'm not sure what the purpose of that is. I don't, but I also don't know where it states. You think grass is cultivated? Okay. Grass is cultivated. Yeah, it's, it's so okay, so there's no requirement species. to mow your grass. Right. 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 Even so around right. the property line. Right. Right. Which we need to amend. Yeah. Right. You so good catch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're saying. We need to amend. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And so you're, what you're saying is even if it is cultivated, it only has to be mowed around the perimeter. The edge is what she was saying. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, yeah that's what this currently reads. Un I, uncultivated non woody plant, which is wild yes. non trees. Like what? What's an example of uncultivated non woody have plant? To grab grass, they want to cut down. Even some people just mow their ragweed, they don't pull it out, they'll just mow it. It's got a whole bed that's increasing. Some people don't like all the golden rock, they so, find it annoying. So, so basically, this is down. saying if you have a wild but, lot, but not a wild lot, an unmanaged lot, mm -hmm. that you have to mow around the edges of your own. Lot, but other than that, but an unmanaged like lot that. is going to have grass. Not no, necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, it could be, like you said, goldenrod or could have right. Yeah, but those grass. things are going to be in a different section. Those Some things are, are going to be addressed in the, the plants okay, so, and weeds. So, so the list of invasive and noxious species does not include <laughs> everything that is not a, yeah. that is a non I mean, like. Uamas, for yeah. example, yeah. is cultivated, yeah. right? Uh, well, I've got a good example. It's really hard to hear of Johnson grass. Now. You know, it looks like um, it's that huge grass. Yeah. It is currently, I don't believe it's currently on this list. But it should be. It should be. There's it's a lot terrible. of it should be. So there's a difference between what OVNR says as... But if you had that around the edges of your property right. and you're letting it grow up, this would require... To mow it. No, it would. Is it really? Would it be uncultivated? Yes, it is, okay. un, it is uncultivated. It just shows up and it's it is considered it's invasive. invasive. It's just that okay. some of this it's stuff is based on. But if the, it was native, if it was native grass, then let's it's say that it's covered. It's native grass. Are there native Ohio grasses? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But that, that, yeah. that would that would not be cultivated, right? Yeah. So the difference between cultivated and not yeah. cultivated, you could say. Cultivated is non uh, non native and non cultivated. I mean, like your, you know, the the what is it called? The tree lawn, right? Mm -hmm. The tree lawn has lawn, right? Mm -hmm. right? Or it, you know, like, I mean, I don't think most of the people in town who have tree lawns that they are required to mow by this cultivated that grass themselves. Are, are we saying we're just going to change it to? Cultivated and non-cultivated? Are we going to say grass and other non-woody plant growth? Well, so well, I, I think we're saying that that you could have a managed natural landscape and manage that to grow as natural plants. Yeah. Or you can have a lawn and mow it. Whether you intentionally plant the lawn or I've done what I do, which is you just mow it there and. A lot of it is natural native grasses and some of it is... So you want mess, for example, you wouldn't have to mow around the perimeter of your property? Mm -hmm. Because it wouldn't grow up 
No, it does. Uh, it will go into your neighbor's property. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Euonymus will be seven seven layers thick. Yeah, but it's know. not going to grow above 12 inches. No, but that's that's something that I think neighbors now would be dealing with anyway. So, yeah. so the point is, I think the, the point about the lawn is very uh, well received. And what I would recommend is that we take another stab at this and create language that is much more clear with regards to um, mono What's actually monoculture yeah. lawn. Monoculture. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's define well, yeah. lawn. Right. You, you're actually, it's miss, it's just missing a chunk. Yeah. Right. Right. The yes. first right. is trees, yeah. plants, and structure. Right. Right. The second is plants and weeds, but then the final one says removal of trees, weeds, and trees, weeds, and grasses, which right. we've never covered grasses in the previous two. Right. So, yeah, that would, I mean, it seems that that would clear it up if you've got it worked in. Yeah. It's simply not there. Right. Yeah. And you that's know, when you're focused on something, you're well, saying no, what mean, is yeah. there is yeah. and exactly and not there. We, we assume oh, that yeah. it would be there because yeah. that's <laughs> right. And then one thing that we are doing, which has to do with education, um, we are working with Beyond Pesticides, which is a nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C., and they'll be coming back to do a workshop on organic lawn care and how to manage that. And it's real organic, not that people who bring washing to say they're organic. Um, and we're going to have an evening open to homeowners so they recognize how they can maintain, if they want lawn, lawns aren't bad, it's how you manage them, um, how to keep them looking beautiful by using environmentally friendly and beneficial aspects that go into feed the soil, not the plants, and, and to have a healthy environment. So, so it's all, you know, lots of those questions about how does somebody know how to do this, this will come in hopefully at the same level that we are trying to elevate the education level and knowledge base of our community as a whole. So that's part of the goal. But we, I think we do need to take that back come back and to come back with this section. For yeah. and and good catch. Is no, it it I just don't think no, it makes any sense. sense. Of staff, I mean, if it doesn't from, mean what I think it me, means, which I been, think is what you guys are yeah. saying, then yeah. you know, then it makes yeah. absolutely no sense at all. Yeah, that doesn't that actually doesn't apply to lawns. It applies to pretty much anything else. Yeah. And then and, and then copy that section of the code and put it into the letter. <laughs> so well, what so here's the last question then, or maybe it's the last not the last question, but what do we think we want that section to say? Do we want the grass to be mowed just on the perimeter? Do we want the whole yard mowed? What do we want? So that if these folks spend their time yeah. coming up with something, they I come mean, back here and say. What I think, what what personally I want, and I have lots of want, is that the things that are noxious can be removed and the other things can grow. I mean, Personally, I have no problem aesthetically with tall grass, but I'm different than other people. I like the requirement, as I understand, stood it until this moment, um, the, the perimeter requirement. I, I would be extremely opposed to having it any more than what I assumed was required in the past. In, in, do you have complaints about people not mowing the grass? Mm -hmm. Very many. Mm -hmm. And is it primarily in one area of the village, or is it all over the village? It's all over. Is it? It's but it's mostly the grass set, right? It's do you think people would be? Is it the perimeter, or is it the whole lawn that has it? No, because Ruthie gets most of those calls. The what? Uh, Ruthie and she gets a lot of those calls, and they get four. I mean, she just writes down the general information, and so whoever is doing zoning or. Now we would send out letters, but um, try to track down the property owners and the property owners. But you've only been Farm sending out letters owners. after July 1st. Right. Yeah. Right. And so the difference would be that this would be required all year long. Right. Is this the only area, the only uh, code that, the only section <coughs> in the code that refers to lawn maintenance is the weeds? Is this the only place where a neighbor can say, hey, it says here, my neighbor has a nuisance lawn, and this is where it says I have, I can call you and have them deal with it. Is there another area in the code that? You mentioned something lawn? about sight lines, like corners. Lines of sight. Yeah. 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 Yeah
that's just setbacks in general. They're, yeah, that's part of the COVID. COVID yeah, the reason they have that 10 foot in the front is so, so somebody's driving back in their car out, they have that line of vision. But that does clearance. it. Clearance. Does that count? Yeah, that, that, that specifies yeah. visibility. Visibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the complaints have zero to do with visibility, and they have everything to do with bugs and beasts. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is not about the um, perimeter. It, it's about the whole lawn. And it's not about do, the do with it what you. I think it's oh, about yeah, aesthetics sure to some is. extent for some people, but I think for other folks, it's more about mosquitoes and bugs and things. So. I'm just saying that as you look at redoing it, it probably should fall well on one side or well on the other side. That, in fact, if you have a yard that's filled with grass, you will have to keep all of that grass mowed unless you have it naturally maintained, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. per some guidelines. Or, no, we just don't care what your yard looks like and just a perimeter so you see and people can complain as they will because they will. So it sort of should fall one way or the other, I think. And that was our recommendation because a lawn that goes just a, a, non, a lawn with non-native species that's just let to go mm -hmm. is no different than having any other invasive species in many ways. So if you want to have a managed natural landscape, you can plant that native grasses and native species and you can manage it that way and not mow it. Mm -hmm. But if you have grass that is just fescue and other types of grass, but if you let that go, it's not really providing any significant habitat. Um, it's just a nuisance in a lot of ways. I understand that there are, that's, you know, that's our perspective on it. Um, and, and it's also, they're really pretty hard to maintain too. There's, there's, it's, a, it's a tricky argument. So we, that's the direction we're going. It, there are a lot of directions you can go with it, but we were, we were trying to strike a balance and really make it possible for people to have that managed natural landscape or to, if you're going to have a lawn, maintain your lawn and take care of your lawn. Okay, so if one had a managed natural landscape, so like native ground covers, for example, and took out their tree lawn, right, and planted, you know, that, they would not have to mow it. Correct. No, 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 yeah, like carrots, yeah, it's it's you know, sedge grass, that doesn't get very tall. So you wouldn't have to mow it. Just just what if it, what if it was a native grass that it didn't get very tall? Well, I don't think it would be really smart to stick it in the tree lawn with people. But I mean, yes, I know, I understand. But it's a matter yeah. of just people using their, their, their you know, well, Some you, people have really tall things in their tree lawn. But lawns. you do have <coughs> here in prairies. Yeah. And prairies get very tall. I have a prairie in my yard, and I have various things that are quite tall. But the, the, the tree lawn, you know, some people have but, put some native. Yeah, but there. that's where the perimeter mowing, right, right and the, or the perimeter um, height requirement of no taller than a foot, you know, could be useful. To, it's 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 there's a loophole there, yeah. is what I'm saying. But, but in that, there's actually a, a, just one word missing in that sentence. It should read, such owners sh owners shall cut or mow or Cause to be cut, grasses. Uh, grasses is missing. That's yeah. it's a tough sentence. The word grass right here, mode grasses or any other. If you put the word grasses or any other, that then makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or it, any other. But the question that comes up. But too. but the thing is, managed natural landscapes are permitted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're not. Grasses or other uncultivated non <laughs> Yeah, plants. and so what about what I'm saying is, in with this wording, the <coughs> height height requirement is not applicable to number four. So you have a five foot high something growing in the on, in the verge and not have to keep it cut, right. even though visibility might be an issue. No, that would be the point where visibility takes precedence. Because so, that. The I that we were so far. Yeah. Then, then that should actually be an issue. And we didn't add that because those still apply outside of this. I mean, we can cite that. What what kind of visibility? Just or visibility pulling out of your driveway so you don't okay. hit somebody or somebody runs into you okay. or a child comes out on a bicycle okay. and they can't this see Visibility is a very broad Yeah, no, in terms of okay. danger, <laughs> danger and traffic. I think it should be. Safety, visibility and safety. People shouldn't have to go to another section. 
to yes. figure out the yeah. ability. It should all so be should put that So we, we can cite that. We'll just cite that yeah. section okay. here. Because yeah. some people, may I give an example? There's some places where there's the, the tree lawn and then the driveway. And the front of this person's property could have five foot grasses, but it doesn't impact safety because by the time she pulls out, she can see both sides, yeah. or he can see both sides of the road. So that's a matter of using our, you know, common sense. But I agree that should be in here to say as long as it does not to deal with. Yeah, we'll just we'll just say the section of the setbacks right. and, um, and safety, so yeah, safety, which we thought was implied. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and then to go back to the grass point. Though. I think Rose, we ought to leave it as it's understood now. Even though it's not written that way, I think we've been enforcing the, if you have a complaint and your yard is crazy, you got to mow it. So as it's understood now is that it shouldn't be more than 12 inches. Yeah. Okay. That's the, the, the whole thing. The, no, whole, the whole thing. thing. That's the way it's written now. That's, that's not way, the way that it's written now. That's, that's but that's the way it's been enforced. <laughs> that's the way so it's you want your choice. Shoot, change it. I think just because that's the way we've been doing I disagree with that, but that's okay. Because it's it, it, it's already, it's all the play covered anyway, as it is. Um, if you do just the perimeter, are you going to have more complaints? I mean, just go ahead. I think you're going to have yeah. less complaints if, because it, it is a, you know, like, it'll be, I think the major thing that you have, have been having about is that none of this applies from April 1st to July 1st. That's, I think that's the major problem. And I would like to see it. what happens if this is actually enforced during those times, how it's written, or okay. how, it, how it's intended to be written pertaining to grass with the perimeter. If you, if you all want to make it how more than this? the perimeter. How about this? How about Denise, can you talk to Remember and see the nature of those complaints? Yes, I think that's handle. a good idea. Find out what the complaints are. What, is it the whole <coughs> lawn or is it only? Is it what time of year is it? That yeah. kind of thing. And uh, and we can go from there. You guys need to make a couple changes also. Well, about the lawn. So, yes. But I, I can pretty much say right now that, that when people call in, they're not saying, um, I'm just upset with the, <laughs> the perimeter of their lawn. It's they're going to say, right. you know. I'm sick and tired of being next to these people who don't mow their yard and it's like three feet well, tall. But Rose's point yeah. is that maybe is that driven by the July 1st or is that just driven by? I mean, like the ticks, right? Or, or I mean, you would think it would be a, a legitimate thing, right? And they're bad during this time that you can't you can't make anyone mow, right? Well, I think the thing you're going to up against. <clears throat> is that it is about aesthetics for most people, it's about property value for most people, it's about what your neighborhood looks like for most people. So you're gonna have that conflict of values of, mm -hmm. um, I want to be able to do the things that I wanna do and have my yard the way I wanna have it, and then you live next to people also. Yeah. So so when this gets written, it will be, I think it will be controversial to some extent because you have people on both sides of that. Right. But I think Denise is right to the point that the complaints are not about the perimeter. The complaints are about my house doesn't look as good sitting next to your house. So it is about house. aesthetics. It is about that and yeah. also about bugs and rabbits and mm -hmm. other sorts of things. It's sort of a combined package. You know, if something mm -hmm. looks really nice and you're like, God, I hate that bug zapper, but God, all right, if they don't want the bugs. But God, I hate that long grass and oh my God, the ticks and the leaves are over here too and it just riles the whole thing. So. No, I do think it's likely to be controversial. I also think that's why council threw it back to you guys. <laughs> because um, I mean, this is a urban this is a hearing, right? It's well, it, it looks like these folks are going to kind of redo that. Piece. But it, yeah. but it was but, advertised as a hearing, and uh -huh. it, it but it probably won't get actually controversial until it goes to council, right? Because no one comes to the planning commission, so um, I get that. Well, I think yeah, twelve inches is not a I mean, we're not talking, you know, a golf course here. We're talking 12 yeah. inches. Yeah. It's not like it's, uh, you know, a well manicured. Yeah. Lot I mean, I think I, what I think that, I mean, I think most people who, you know, will try to comply for this, they're already mowing the perimeter. They will mow their lawn. But I just don't think it needs to be required that way. 
I, I do agree with what Judy had said earlier that we have to be very clear. And, and yes. if there are new rules, that's going to be a whole can of worms if it's like it's not required. So I'll say, you know, someone comes up and says, sorry, it's not my problem. So I think we really need to try to develop more of a, a balanced approach that would address. Because it's like if you have green lawn, monogreen lawn, why wouldn't you mow it? That's why you want it to begin with. Right. So if someone else moves in afterwards, that's the issue. You've got a change of owners. So they have a whole different concept. It's like, whoa, I'm in Yale Springs. I can do what I want. I'm just mm -hmm. going to let it, you know, go to whatever. So I think we need to look at all, all different scenarios. And to be fair, and, and part of this is not just about, oh, just putting something out there so it's there and it's, it, it's based on enforcement. What, what we really feel in the Environmental Commission that is education. You know, the more that people understand this is just not just a document with words, why is this like this? I know most people won't ask that, but why are these species invasive? What's happened? Why are some bugs beneficial or not? So that's one way of getting people to not continue a cycle that hasn't been very positive well, to I the environment. Like the, if, if there could be like a, I don't know, if the Environmental Commission puts out documents, but like an addendum, not that's in the code, but like an official document from the Environmental Commission that does more and that, that could be referred to in the code, if that's like possible. Paper or something. Yeah, that talks, you know, that's updated more, you know, easier and uh, more regularly than the code that talks about, you know, managed natural landscapes are hard to, you know, are hard to maintain, they're hard to establish. Right, it takes a lot. You know, the there are a lot of work, right? And so the you know the in between time between you know like when you're not mowing an area that you don't want to continue to mow that you don't want to be alone. You know, like I just think. Yeah. So I I would like to see more document, not necessarily for this to pass, but I'm encouraging the environmental commission to work on that as well with the things that I come think up. referring the public to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources is adequate because they have the lists of the invasive, they have the lists of the pests and, and the good pests. Are and there are also a lot of um, workshops that people can attend. So it's like, you know, people are that are available or uh, there's so much information online and so people can we could give links. Education is part of our commitment. Uh, I mean, a two-page so, thing is yeah. what I'm talking um, about. I think, like, it, I think it's a really good point. To give um, more Because I do, I do agree with what Judy was saying. Instead about it's an aesthetic issue, and people would prefer not to have um, bugs and tall grass next to them. But there's a lot of the people that are managing their natural landscape and would really not like to see non-native species and lawnmowers burning gasoline next to them. And so I think what we're trying to accomplish is to um, be able to say, if you're going to do this, you can do that, and you should do it in a way that is reasonable. If you're going to have a lawn, you should mow your lawn, right? You should take care of your lawn and not have uh, invasive species in it. If you're going to have a managed natural landscape, you should take care of your managed landscape. I think that there's right a now. difference between you should mow your lawn and have to mow your lawn, all of it. it you know, from a, an a enforcing aesthetic standards, I think the the perimeter is is what we can say you have to, and I think you should is fine. But this is, I mean, like this isn't a you should, you know, ease you should. I I just think like number three is you have to. And well, so we've always like been kind of a point driven of the enforcement. Right. Yeah. It's not like we have the people cruising the streets. But we don't um, say that but, I, but at the beginning of our doing just says that it makes a lot of sense to me too. If you're not mowing your yard, your lawn, then then those and which is what we often get complaints about, those dandelions pop up and then they start seeding and going into the other people's yards where they don't they don't want. At least if you're yeah, maintaining your yard, then you're taking care of those those weeds as well. Dandelions will grow in a lawn that's under 12 inches. That's mowed, you know. I think Denise is just making an example. Yeah. 
You can sure. use the Canada thistle. Okay. Yeah. But the Canada <laughs> thistle is, yeah. yes. but the thing is, yeah. the Canada thistle is is supposed to be removed. Right. right. So that's right. out of. Right. I think I, it's, it's a different. The thing in your mind is, and this is what the, the police department and the and planning and zoning have to use to do any kind of. Uh, neighbor dispute, any kind of complaint that happens, it's got to be very clear. Uh -huh. And it may come yes. down to a contentious discussion and a vote, but I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can leave it unclear because yeah. the folks who have to go in and enforce have to do that. Yeah. And it, it may be a very uncomfortable conversation, but, you know. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise we're just going to say we don't have an ordinance for that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Could Can I that's it? recommend that we take this back yes. and uh, work on it and, and to save your time? And, uh, <laughs> and but uh, that was really good to catch that because yeah. that would have been a big problem mm -hmm. if, uh, before it gets. Um, and we will be talking about it at this on the 18th because we have the uh, climate action plan meeting. But we will likely be talking about it at the next meeting. And you're welcome to come to our meeting. Yeah, your input there. When are you going to be talking about this? Uh, it will likely be the following. We don't have an agenda for it, but it will likely be the, let's see, so that's October. It will likely be in the uh, third, third Tuesday uh, in November okay. at 545. 15th? November 15th is the third Tuesday? Okay. Yeah, after planning, November 15th. And if any of you want to do mm -hmm. some background research on Chip Osborne, who will be coming to do a workshop, he, he's in conjunction with Beyond Pesticides, you can go on his website. But he's basically in the top of the industry for organic lawn care and does all the tests to make sure that products that come out are truly organic and not harmful to children, pets, or the environment. So, and us, sure. of course, we're the bottom of the list. But. And how long is that supposed to last? That's the one next year. No, the, the Environmental Commission. Oh, okay. okay. The, so that we will meet till 7, right? Yeah, 7, and, and it might go longer. We're working on it. Start at will start. It's not going to be an hour long. <sighs> so, but we're going to hopefully allow people to find us for themselves if they want. But it will likely go longer. Yes. I'm not going to be able to go to that, but I think somebody here at the Planning Commission should go. Say next go. Tuesday. Yeah. I think I will go. Thank I mean, you. That's good. That's good to have that perspective for us to have that perspective. And from the from Denise and I have resources that we can tap in. It would be useful to uh, envision like communities. I, I don't know uh, Burlington, Vermont. Or, I mean, think of like-minded communities, and we can then pull their uh, ordinances and just look at okay, these are similar kinds of people and places. What are they doing? If that's of any use to the discussion, I don't know that it is. I think it is. Um, Actually, for the, yeah, and uh, Overland's a good example from uh, Ohio climate ice plant. Overland happens for two good places to look at. Both of them are larger than Yellow Springs, which makes it a little tricky, but um, they're the other, Overland and Athens. This is for the climate action plan, yeah. not to do the lawn care. For, if you want lawn care, there's places on the East Coast that can give yeah. you examples of that. Cincinnati also has a lawn a managed action plan. Uh, yeah, county.
uh, you folks had a pretty long conversation about this last time? We did. We didn't really get too far. <laughs> we had a long conversation. We did. I think so. Uh, I guess since then, we now know that the county does not have any specific Airbnb regulations. No. Uh, uh, when they, when they're, as Al Kuzma said, when there's an absence of something, then they have to fall. That has to fit in what is existing. And so, basically, the you know the Airbnb concept is you're running out your whole home to a person or persons that are together, and so therefore. Um, this or part of your home, or part of your home, and it's and so therefore their code really doesn't apply because um, <clears throat> in order for it to be borders, it has to be five or more separate individuals. Um, if it is, um, are five or more people in the house in separate rooms? A yeah, rooming house is less than five. A rooming five or less. Yeah, a rooming house is like three or more than three or something. It was not five five people is what I read. Essentially, the, with the with the idea of the Airbnb, over five. Five. It's under five. five, five and under, yeah. Yeah, with the rooming house. Sort of touching. Yeah, good. And then I was surprised that food was not considered as a part of a rooming house. Where do we do we have the um, B and B regulations? Our current B and B regulations in here right now? No. You mean what we require? Yeah. No, I mean they're in your zoning code. I don't have it. What section is that? Um, let's see, it's probably under conditional use requirements. You know, I guess if we're not wanting to do anything major, I just wondered why don't we look at expanding the short term rental and simply make it, because right now it's renting one week or more. And why don't we make it that it could be daily? I mean, it could be co cover that because it seemed like that's sort of covered. We cover it. And the short-term rental requires a conditional use hearing. Is that correct? Does it? Mm -hmm. that well, would be, which would be good. And they would have to have emergency contact information to the um, zoning administrator. I so that's my biggest problem. I think with the Airbnbs is if you buy a house or rent a house in the neighborhood. You want to know what's going on in the houses yeah. around you with somebody, and if that's a cut, if you pause, then at least you know. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure, and I guess you know we'll discuss that. I'm not sure if I would necessarily want a hearing on everyone, but I think that you should officially know, and you, or maybe you do want a hearing because maybe you want to consider looking at the neighborhood to see how many other ones are in the neighborhood right now. You know, we don't know, but I did tell you when I went to the website, now it was looking at the, I think, the greater area, but it had 119 for Yellow Springs. And I went through, and there were a number of people that I knew that as I went up, I saw, yeah, they are in Yellow Springs. Yeah, and when I, I went after you said that, and, I, and there were only actually a few that were Yellow Springs, and then it started getting out yeah. to the greater, broader area all the way to Centerville. And Oakwood, that was still, if you type Yellow Springs, you got, you know, also. There's so more Yellow up. Springs, though, than what I think you know. And it probably changes I yeah. mean, every week or so. I mean, uh, I guess yeah, uh, people leave town. But it, it, but it does seem something like that. The neighbors, if you buy a house, if you have young children, you know, I would want to know if there are going to be people coming in and out of this place, so that you just you know, have that awareness. Mm -hmm. I agree. And perhaps you could add a caveat that if it were to occur at that location more than two to three times per year. I mean, I think there are some folks who are like, well, it's a big street fair, I can make a little extra money right. once, this one time I'm going to do it, is a very different affair than I have a house, I don't live in town, I'm going to regularly rent that out, or this is an attached garage, I'm going to regularly rent that out. And, and that's what some of them are, that people have, you know, like a, a big garage or, it's, you know, and they're renting that out as their Airbnb, and and it's done, you know, regularly or as regularly as they can get it rented. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, so I have had a short-term rental apartment 
No. And I currently rent a room on Airbnb. So I have some experience with this. And you rent a room on what? Airbnb. Okay. So I started doing the short-term rental before the zoning code changed, before there was a regulation to have a hearing. As there were probably about a half a dozen short-term rental apartments. Mine is in, I have a duplex, so mine is part of my home. Um, there are various ways to advertise. So one is on the Yellow Springs, Stay Yellow Springs website. One is Airbnb, one is VRBO, Vacation Rental by Owner, and there's at least one other one. So Airbnb is just a way to advertise. It's pretty much just an app. Yeah. So um, I did do the short-term rental. The way it's written in the code is incorrect because it could be one night, it could be a month. Um, I've rented short-term rental for several months, as do all the others. I mean, Bob Sweeney is probably the biggest short-term rental guy, and he'll rent for a night or two nights or whatever. So that wording in our code for short-term rental should be changed. I think most Airbnb places are just a bedroom, but sometimes they, like I advertise on Airbnb when I rented out the apartment. I didn't really get much traction in it. But, um, so, do, do you have any questions? <laughs> so, I mean, I've been doing this for six years. So, would you um, think that, you know, if we added, if we changed the definition of a short-term rental, right, then um, for people who needed, who, who rented out the room, you know, a room in their house, right, for a short term, for a short period of time, one or more nights, you know, one or more days. nights for, you know, two weeks a year, should they be required to come and have a conditional use hearing? Um, for two weeks a year? Yeah. No, I wouldn't think so. But I mean, but if we change the, the I mean, someone who rents out a room periodically. For example, uh, Patricia Snyder brings in a yoga teacher, one different yoga teachers, and there are people. She has a list of people that will rent out their room to those yoga teachers. So they do that for maybe one or two weeks a year. Right. I don't think you want to have. Yeah. So we need. I mean, we just we need to rewrite this. Yeah, so then the question that kind of like Rose is bringing up is where do you draw the line? Yeah. Right? When is when is it then are you making an impact on the neighborhood? I mean, I, I, I can tell you now I I'm having someone every weekend. So so do you At think least throughout the summer? Do you think that you should be required to have a conditional use um, well, hearing? I, I mean my understanding is that I was grandfathered in. That may or may not be the case. Do you think know. other other people but, who but, are doing the same thing? I do thing. think that and that it's that it's good. That, that it's no different than having uh, you know guests or someone. I mean, it, I think a big difference is I live there, so you know if someone's in my home, I know that they're there. If if you're just renting out a house and people are coming and going, that's a different thing. I think you know in terms of the neighbors. But I do think that it's a courtesy to the neighbors to know that, you know, yeah. I mean, there is people. a difference than just having guests over, right? Because this is the thing that we talk about with, um, you know, people making food for people in their house that were just guests, right? Like, that one day a week, right? Like, there, you know, if there's money being exchanged, it's it's no longer it's, it's no longer having I guess so, right? yeah. yes, so yeah I mean which I actually I'm kind of too too based about it I guess but well I, I know I definitely am I think it's a great idea to have short-term rentals available to people but I also agree that it's great it's it, it is more than a courtesy to let the neighbors know yeah. and, and and so the question is where do you Cross the line. You cross a line like, you know, like you, maybe you spot up, but not living there, running out your entire house. Well, is I think that the, one ma line, the major some but you know, number of weeks. The, there are or, some. There are some folks that I know, and I'm not going to say their names because clearly they're not registered. But they have um, 
parts, uh, uh, like uh, over their garage is, you know, fixed up and all that. And they're renting that out on a regular basis. So it's adding traffic, more parking, you know, different people coming in and out. Maybe it's like 14 days. If it's more than 14 days a year, they should have to come and get a conditional use. Because it just seems to me that neighbors need to know if this is going on. And, and yet you need to, because you don't want, like in one neighborhood, you don't want 15, 10 houses all doing it. Um, that, you know, we talk about property value, uh, traffic, parking, all of that. It, it, affordability. Yeah. I, my main problem with it is affordability because, you know, there are, there are properties in town that, you know, have three apartments in them, right? And they're month to month, right? And um, if they started doing even shorter term rentals than that, a weekend, you know, they could be, you know, what is an $800 apartment a month could be, you know, $100 a night. And, and that's not available to somebody who can And then it's not available for someone who, who actually time. lives here full time. I mean, that's terrifying to me, honestly, because we are a tourist town. Well, um, I can tell you having done that, because that's what I did. I rented out the I mean, it sounds short horrible term. to be it, It's a lot of work to do yeah. it. Yeah, um, obviously. Which is why I saw yeah. <laughs> Clay, <laughs> you know, in terms of parking, I mean, you have one car coming your house. Now, yeah, you have, maybe you need to have that parking place, which I do, I have parking for probably six cars, but um, I think letting the neighbors know, um, I'm not sure that we would have so many short-term rentals that it would really take away, what we need is more rental housing, Yeah. period, because it is work, it's a really different kind of but having, I, I will, in favor of short-term rentals and rooms, it really is, uh, it's a way for people to come into Yellowstone. So it's an economic development thing, not just the person yeah. doing it, but they come, they eat downtown, they buy stuff downtown, right. some of them move to Yellow Springs. I've had friends stay at the Amyot Gate, for example, which is a beautiful old house, and it's rented out short-term, and, you know, that was, it has a kitchen, and, that, you know, yeah, like, yes. that's, Something that we've really never and had. Provide, I mean, the people that I get mostly are from Columbus and Cincinnati, and it's young couples. That's the majority. But then sometimes it's parents of Antioch students, Cedarville students, mm -hmm. someone taking a class at Antioch and Midlands. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I mean, it sounds like we're going to need to at least modify this line. Yes. Yes. And, and, and I guess the question would be, to answer for Denise, if we're going to ask her to do that, is what do we want to include in that with respect to time or uh, number of rentals per year or something? And is there some mechanism besides having a conditional use hearing for neighborhood notification? Not the number of, I mean, I guess if you just do that, and that's like a change of use, but I would, well, we do change of use um, barely ever, but if we do, then that change of use might go more to official places like uh, the fire department and the Green County Building Regulations and those places, it doesn't go to neighbors. One other thing I thought of, and that was part of the discussion with Ted Donnell when he was here last time, is that part of that the process permitting should also include that they have insurance that will cover that because one of the things Ted pointed out is that if they don't and if if it's not something that's permitted that there if something happened their insurance isn't going to pay for it and it could actually fall back on the village but the village could have some liability if we if we intend to Cover it, but I guess I don't really know what we're, we'd all, already be kind of liable for under the short-term rental as it is because how, I don't see a lot of difference between that short-term rental. Um, What's the difference between boarding homes and short-term rental? 
40 homes is multiple different tenants that are renting mm -hmm. and then that More gets it then that kicks in the green county building regulations okay. um i mean i know there's people that have like ex they basically take like an ex like a garage and they've converted it yeah okay and um if they there's a they if they want to do that and make an accessory dwelling they're supposed to already come to us for conditional use. Now, that being said, I've never had them come to say that the purpose is to do it short term. So I'm not really sure how that evolved in the in the zoning process for the short term rental, or if it was to capture some uh, some places that were operating sort of like a miniature version of a motel hotel kind of situation. I don't know. Do you have now, or maybe would you prepare, like, what, are there, do you have any questions for us already that we haven't already raised, like, about what we want changed? Because, you know, your question about, you know, setting, Re the reason for inviting the Airbnb owners, right? Like, oh yeah, um, having a agenda, right, for that meeting that is specific questions formulated in a way to, you know, to answer the things that the questions that we have about, like, how long. How many days a year would one have to operate a short-term rental before a conditional use required. is required? That's one of the questions that I've heard already. There are other questions that I have that I don't really know if I could make a list of, but it seems like right. So I'm not you saying you wouldn't have people come that operate here. That's that's where I got. I was advised that I was like a slippery slope. I would I like think it is a slippery slope. I would like a list of the questions that we all of the possible questions that we would need to answer before we writing them. But maybe I need to make that. I'm sorry, I'm not following you. I'm sorry, I'm not following you. Do you mean you can, can I Yeah, go ahead. You're saying a slippery slope if we ask people to come here for a conditional use permit? No. To come to get input on how we write this. Yes. Because oh. yeah. oh. they may not necessarily want us to know what's going on. Right. I think it would be helpful to know from the village solicitor or someone legally what is the liability of the village and what should, because I noticed for short term rental there isn't anything about insurance. No. And that just seems to me that that would, and probably a lot of them, you know, it's covered. I'm sure well, well, about that. All the other uses, we don't say you need insurance. Yeah, no, you don't. But, but you're right. But when you have other people in your home, and if all you have is home insurance, it's probably not going to cover but if you're getting money for it. Right? And Ted also insisted that the health, you know, that the, the county has regulations that, you know, that we've seen now. They don't. They don't. I mean, right. I didn't think he insisted. I thought he said that was a place to start to ask no, the county. I said that. <laughs> he said, "Do not ask the county." I know what I'm talking about. Sorry. I I agree that that I I I don't think that we're liable. Yeah. Ted, what what said that we yeah we what, as a village, one of the things he so. said, and it does kick in at a certain point, is depending on how many people you have in the house is those firewalls and that kind yeah, of stuff yeah. that he was talking about. And then you do have different codes, which yeah. I think that Al Kuzma had, had mentioned. Um, I can ask legal, I mean, because at some point, I mean, the, the, I mean, we have, we have um, bed and breakfast described in our conditional use, we have hotels and motels, but those are also covered by county as well. Yes, yes. Um, but like even uh, but we're talking less than four, which is what it makes no, it less short term. Right. Five or less. Less than five. Yeah, and, and five. Al, five or less. Five or less. And as Al Kuzma said, you know, it is a new phenomenon. They don't, they don't have any. 
thing, so they go with what they do have, which means it's like a regular house being built. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to put in the firewall or yeah. just, you know. Five or less. Well, I don't know if we need to go that far either, but I think, you know, right now our short-term rental thing says that we should really consider the too. negative effect on the surrounding neighborhood. Yeah, and so, I mean, I, I think, think the fact that it's been again. a week or more is, as Susan said, just change that, and I can work with that. Yeah, I mean, that might be the simplest thing. It might be the simplest thing to do, and then, and then um, you know, a conditional use hearing isn't saying no, it's just saying, is permitted with conditions that yes. you guys are going to impose on And them. you allow the neighbors to comment on it. Right. Yeah. Right, because they're notified of the hearing. Well, I'd like to know the legal, because perhaps, you know, and I'd like to know that the village has no liability, but it might be good at least to encourage these folks that they need to make their insurance company aware of. And we might very well be able to just get away with saying, like, you know, like I started putting on letters um, on the on the fence permit that I stayed on there that, you know, you are responsible for knowing where your property lines are. Yeah. You know, then you can get that by contacting the Green County Reporter, maybe getting a survey, or having someone come out and find the pins. But then that takes that off of us yeah. because, you know, I'm, I'm, Believing in what they're showing me. Yeah, you're approving a fence that based on what they're telling me is their property line. Yeah, you don't want liability to right. build it in the wrong And I felt by adding that, that kind of helps us, but maybe we need to go a little further um, with things like this. I'll ask them. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I yes. Um, I hope you don't go too far with this. I mean, Yes, it's good for the neighbors to know, and yes, there is needed parking, but, uh, you know, what about people who rent out their house from the summer, three months, periodically? Well, right away, they have to come and have a hearing for this, and that's a pretty common thing for people to do. Um, so, and the whole thing about a fire, I mean, if I rent out my bedroom sometimes, or what? Oh, yeah, and it's not covered. I mean, it isn't required. It's, it's only you get to a certain level. It's right? only you get to a certain level. Like if you're, you've got five rooms that you're running out, then it changes it to a hotel or a bed and breakfast type of situation. That's when the Green County Code kicks in. I think that we should state what the maximum occupancy is for ourselves. I don't think we should just, you know, just go to the health department requirements because it makes this unclear. I mean, a dwell, a short-term rental unit, a dwelling that unit that is rented or leased to one person, family or entity, on a weekly or monthly basis, but typically less than one year. So that just says one person, and then the maximum occupancy says the number of tenants permitted shall be determined by the health department requirements. That is a that is right there contradicts itself, right? Mm -hmm. Am I reading that wrong? I don't think so. If you're, you're, the short-term rental is one person, family, or entity. So yeah. it could be more than one person if it's a family of five. Yeah, but it, yeah, I would think that the tenants is the number of, number of tenants Okay. I, I would not want to rewrite or duplicate anything that the county already has. Okay. They're, they're so, but, sufficient. but this is saying that you could not have two separate units of money coming in in a short term right. rental unit. That's right. Short, it's a short term yeah. rental of just one property, one thing. I'm not following what you're thinking, what you're saying. Like if someone had two rooms. You can rent them to the same family, but you can't, you can't rent, rent them to two separate right. people. That's the way it reads now, I think. Yeah. In the definition. Yeah. That's released to one person. Family. And that's not even, yeah. that's in a different chapter, right? That's in a different chapter than the requirements 
specific it's the word definition. Yeah, yeah, I always have to go to the definition to further clarify what I'm. That's the, the way Which is ridiculous. Set up. Well, that's the, that's the way they. So if we're going to change the requirements, specific requirements, that needs to be in there. This happens again and again. Why the definition is not included on the requirements of a conditional use baffles me to no end. It's un inaccessible to the people who are trying to navigate the system and trying to follow the rules. Yeah, it's a lot better than it used to be, let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I believe, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's still absolutely. got, I mean, there's a reason there's people, like five years there's a reason point. we, how many conditional use requirements for short-term rentals do we have? Have we given up since we passed this? Zero. How many, what? How many conditional use requirements have we approved I for short-term rental units? I haven't had any. But do you know, I mean, on file, how many do you have? Okay. Is short term rental units a new I, thing? I don't have to go back and look. I don't know. We I should. I, I, doubt, I doubt This it. is on another I subject, mean, I have had a couple people consciously me call me. And conditional ask me. use requirements list on all of the things where they're all in one place so that we know exactly what it is. Because I feel like with staff turnover as it has been, you know, we've lost all that information. What's the point of conditional use requirements, conditional use applications, if we don't have a state running list of all the ones that we've approved? Oh, I'm not saying we haven't. We don't have that. I'm saying I, I didn't go. Oh, okay. No, yeah, we do. I, okay. I go with that. I'd like to know how many <laughs> short-term rental units we've approved from 2013 to to now when this short-term rental came into place. I so we didn't have anything before for short-term. I think it was short warm someplace else. And I know that we were talking about um, our meeting ending at 6. Now, I know we're almost at 6, so I wondered if you... Judy's already left. It wasn't just Judy. Oh, yeah, it's, it's you too? Yeah. And so oh, I wondered if we so maybe I should have our discussion well, I know about what the I Airbnb, not the Airbnb, at the... Uh, pocket neighborhood. Yes, the pocket neighborhoods at our next meeting. Um, Well, I, I, even if we did 15 minutes, just even a little bit of time on pocket neighborhood, only because the next meeting I I fear is going to be huge, um, because Hill Week is planning on bringing forth a couple of different properties um, on Dayton Street at conditional use hearings. That's going to be that's going to take some time. Okay. Um, and otherwise, this is going to go into next year. Okay. Um, but I, I think I have enough. 2013 to present of any other short-term rentals, and I'll check on the legal uh, legal liability. And, and I would like, even if they, I would simple. like to say that maybe we encourage them to have it covered by insurance. Oh yeah. Because what I understood, and, and Ted may not be an expert on it, but that if your insurer doesn't know that you're doing this, mm -hmm. it could make it null and void if something happens. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And the homeowner the then would be the one that loses the out. Yeah. Fine print of the policy yeah. and probably says something about that. Yeah. Right, it's, it's just sort of nice to make people aware and protect them. Yeah. yeah, and I mean I don't think we should need to get too too crazy about it because I mean I agree. I mean whole if if a land people have been rent houses for a year long lease with landlords here in town and I don't know, that must go under some other thing, but we don't regulate that at all. So we're supposed to have it as a change of use, but that never happens. Okay, I think okay. it sounds like a different discussion. <laughs> Pocket neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Um, I started to try to write a sample code like you had asked me to, when and realized this was becoming daunting and its effect on the entire zoning code even even like inserting a chapter um, I mean I guess you know all the chapters are even numbers and I don't know if they're even numbers so for the potential to insert a, a new section in later I don't know um, but uh, it's going to be it's pretty big and 
one of the things that came up before was um, Grove City does has a PUD residential and which I don't know if you, you probably I forgot to make copies of this today. I found I did we were missing one thing. I'll just let you go. I'm just going to send this down to you. But the way they do it with PUD residential is they have like these setback requirements for um, other types of things, but if it's a single family, like what they're wanting to do, they leave it up to the planning commission and then on to council to uh, decide the density. Okay. Okay. Now that in and of itself becomes like what the issue with PUDs have been. Essentially a BMD. Is okay. it's, it's just the same as what we already have, and you have all these differences. I mean, it would, but if we could have a PUD residential that allowed for, and that where we spelled out the density, then then they could, you could have that pocket neighborhood, like say if you, let's say it was a, an acre or two acres, and you could have 12 or 14, or if we, if we could spell out something like that, it might, I mean, I guess what I was hearing uh, being said was that Going through the PUD process is super difficult. Well, looking at this, to me, this looks, you know, very challenging. The one that um, yeah. uh, Grove City has. Yeah. I mean, that's why I, I would hate to put pocket neighborhoods under that because it just looked really mm -hmm. onerous for them. So, um, has it, who's, who's been through this? Yeah. Okay, so, so when someone comes forward, they start with what? They start with well, it's, it's essentially, you do a certain percentage, percentage of the design, and you bring that so it's expensive. for staff review, and then there's all these iterations, and plus those are dealt with, and it comes to planning commission, and then, then it goes to council, and so it's just it's and then, a and multi, then, multi multi step process. And then rezoning happens after that. Well, well, the council then brings the PUD. And it's rezoned PUD. Right. right. Yeah. And that's part of that process, then? Yeah. Yeah, but it takes months and months. I mean, not only do you have probably several months just getting it to the point where you're able to discuss it with staff, but then the planning commission, I think, has to have two hearings on it. So there's another two months there at a minimum. Because you have to And you have to spend all the money yeah. to have that done and may find out at the end that it won't be approved. Right. Right. Which is a real challenge. Yeah. I liked the last time we had the two... Um, pocket neighborhood plans in our packet. And we talked about the one that we like that uh, just the model ordinance one. Yeah. Yes. And I you know and I and I like that. You know, they and it seemed to be from our reading and what I think one of these people wrote that the issue seemed to be in some neighborhoods is that the units didn't look similar to the surrounding area. And so the neighbors were upset about it. That they wanted it, you know, to be somewhat similar to their, their community. Then you're going to have design standards, and that's going to be. The what? You got to have design standards. Well, some of them did, and I and we sort of talked about that. And I and yeah. I didn't want us to have any, but any, but that seemed to be one of the complaints that a lot of communities had of the way that they looked. Yeah. So I guess my question then becomes, how is the pocket neighborhood as its own chapter going to save time? See, exactly, because you would have to, the thing is it would be a standard zone. So they would rezone to pocket neighborhood, right, mm -hmm. is what was being suggested. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, the regulations would be different than all of the other ones all the other, so it would still go before planning commission and council, right? Right. Um, but it would be, it wouldn't be spot zoning, it would be spot zoning the standard, right? Like it would be standard spot zoning instead of every single thing being different. And so you would be like, hey, I want to build pocket neighborhood here. Can I rezone to pocket neighborhood? 
and then we would be like, oh, yes, you can, and council would be like, yes, you can, and we would know that the pocket neighborhood would fit within the constraints of the pocket neighborhood zone. So it would be conditional use? Yes. No, it would be rezoning. I think, my opinion but is But you still have those standards under a PUD, under a PUD area, so we don't have to create them. Yeah, we, we could, could right? We another could, layer of yeah, so we could do like asking. PUD, but the thing is PUD, PUD requires a lot of stuff up front. Yeah, which is right? you don't have to do all of that. No, yeah. you would to rezone, you wouldn't, right? You would, then in would my opinion, okay. I don't think yeah. that you need a, a new zone. I think we should change the rule requirements for one of our other zones, our residential zones already, to fit within someone being allowed to do a plant, a, a pocket neighborhood in that zone, and if someone needs to rezone to that zone and pot, and spot zone to, you know, our, our C, right, or our... Mm -hmm. so I would say it's not allowed in RA, it can only be yeah. RB and RC, let's say. Yeah, okay. and, and they rezone to RC, they say, we're doing a pocket neighborhood, in my opinion, if you're doing a pocket neighborhood, probably have a at least a preliminary plan you can show someone and and then you know but it would be conditional let's say conditionally allowed in RC and it already so that, that's where I guess I'm, I'm getting hung up on the on that part of to me don't you still have to do all the upfront money I and mean, you're still going to come up with you're so saying you don't I'm well, saying the the purpose of it is to make it so that our 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 approval process is easier because we can it's like a boilerplate this is what it is this is the requirements instead of hashing out every single requirement which is what a so, PD is. So if you have a subsection in all three residents or two or whatever and in that you define the density in terms of number of houses per acre or whatever yes. you, do you choose, you identify setbacks, you identify parking requirements, and then, and you still make it a conditional use. Mm -hmm. Then there's still, you don't have to go into the detail about the drainage and about yeah, all exactly. that other stuff. It could be conditional in all residential But you still have to come to the planning commission yeah. conditional use so the neighbors have their yeah. input. And and it stays out of the PUD. Yes, yes. I I think it, it should be conditional in all residential use. Residential but then does it, is it become, does it go through the subdivision thing? I mean, you... I don't know, we have to figure out where it goes. It depends yeah. where we would... I mean, you have to start with... It would have to be some subsection in each of those sections, though. I mean, I guess, I guess the thing is, if someone could say, okay, we approve the concept but now you're going to have to go through this whole site plan review process and then they can pay for all of that well it's site a, plan review a, process is just with staff what if it's a yeah. conditional use right. it's like it's just a conditional use and it's conditionally allowed in the residential zones and the can and the requirements of the conditional use are these separate separate standards that are more lenient Right in this particular area, does that work? Well, that's what I'm wondering. I just trying to find a way that that doesn't make it so difficult for people to do this development. I mean, and not making them spend all this money to come to the end and find out that they don't even get to do it. Yeah. Um, but yet, you know, doesn't hurt the neighbor. You know. We could say, oh, no way, there's not going to work in that Exactly. Area. But then, right. you know, and, and, and not creating a whole new chapter. Yeah, or a new zone. You don't even right. have to create right. a new zone. Right. I think, you, I think you can find a way to put it in the individual residential districts. But you're, you're going to have to define density and setbacks. And, and that model ordinance had that. It did. It have was that. really good. And but I, it had, and and I it felt like, like very I could nice work with that. that you could, because it, it did have certain things that you wanted in Boston neighborhoods. You wanted to have some community space. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be a building, but it could be a small building, or it could just be space, a garden, you know, whatever. And all of the the lot, you know, if there needed to be any lot changes, that 
that would could happen sort of consecutive, like at the same time, and it that wouldn't be approved if the pocket neighborhood wasn't approved, and you know, like that would still go through the standard process that it has to go through, but it wouldn't be like I rezoned and then I can't, you know, I can't replot or replat or I replatted and I can't rezone. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's I understand that the PUD is a difficult process, but part of it also protects the, the community by having the site review, by you know, looking at where the drainage is. It's expensive for the developer, and, and I you know, sympathize with that, but the cottage concept can fit under the PUD without having the to do anything more. Well, it would be unfair to every single developer because they would have different requirements on their pocket neighborhood every single time. If we have at least a boilerplate a, a boiler requirement, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. and, and parking. But we and still require, we, it doesn't matter what, what PUD or not, you're still going to have to come up with with a storm management water plan, and you've got to, we still are going to require that. But it could be reviewed by staff instead of going through two oh, hearings here yeah. and two hearings of council. And, and, and I think the, the big advantage is that it would still have a hearing. Just that you're wanting to create more affordable housing. Right. And you're wanting to make better use of land that's still left to right. So it would allow that. Right. And see, right now we have. In, in like RC, it's um, per acre, it's eight or 12 or something. It was just changing that to a higher number. Yeah. Yeah. It might be something as simple as that. Yeah. I think it's more than that. Because you, you don't want a higher thing. number, but you might want different setbacks. Right. Yeah. Well, that's true. Because you're clustering Shared things. parking and. Right. So I don't know how, I mean, I guess I just need some guidance on. If we do it under RADRC, I mean, as far as is it a footnoting thing and then you go to another a layer or can't it be a conditional use? Oh, yeah. that I mean, we can definitely do that. I mean, in terms of. But conditional use wouldn't change the requirements in the zone, the building requirements in the zone. Yeah, not necessarily because all the setbacks would stay the same. Could they? But see, so the step back might change under a pocket neighborhood. I mean, that's exactly part of it, right. that it would, it would have it, it would be standard for pocket yeah. neighborhoods. Yeah, but it would allow setbacks to be a little bit different, so and that all your houses don't have to be. So you could say if you want to, if, if you want to have a higher density than section twelve, da, 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 and then it would take you to a, to a part in the conditional uh, use section. Uh, requirements uh, yeah. for what we're calling a pocket neighborhood yeah. or something. Or, or, uh, or, or general provisions. I mean, you go to several yeah. places. And do we want to call it pocket neighborhood or would it be just more dense, uh, denser type of I like or calling it a pocket neighborhood. Too. Okay. But, you know, I think I don't care what you call it. I think Better it's, than the cottage housing. I think it's way more descriptive. But cottage housing, cottage is a. It's a small house. It's what you're putting in. It's cottages. But it could be any number of things. It would be a cottage. <laughs> and I can't remember if the model they said. I know the thing that um, we got, um, I don't know if it was Grove City, the initial stuff, it had some information on square footage mm -hmm. that it couldn't couldn't be over a certain square footage. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of nice. I don't remember if the model uh, one had that. I, I know there was some, there, I don't know, it was like 12, they couldn't be larger than 1,200 square feet. And that may have been it. That, that, that was, was that the size. Yeah. And then, and, but that was not including the porch. That's that was just the, well, that was the Grove City. Oh, was that the Grove City? It was the, this one. Was this was this Grove City? Yeah, that's Grove City. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was this Grove City. And I think one of, I guess one of the things I was concerned about with the model one, and it was only with that. I mean, there were just a couple things. 
that it had like that every bit house had to have a porch in it. And I wasn't so sure if that maybe that should be an and, and and Ted rather like not having it quite as strict. That's true. That you could have you could have porches if you wanted, but maybe not. Because I was just thinking of people who would get them, they might not all want a porch. You need to leave. Are we um, okay. Okay. Um, I just want to see part of this. <laughs> Where are you going? Uh, my kid's a senior in the varsity soccer team. Oh, you just go. Okay. Yeah, so they're playing at six. They're playing here home game, Columbus International. So anyway. Well, um, have we made progress here? I think we have. No, I have. Yeah. At least I have some direction now. And thank you for you know thinking we could do this without creating a whole new chapter because of like. Jerry, you're awfully quiet. Anything to say about this? Oh. The only thing I would prefer is uh, pocket versus cottage. Okay. <laughs> I can live with that. I can live with that. I can live with that. You know, that now, now whether I, oh, I agree, I like the pocket. But I don't honestly don't expect this at the next video because it's going to be pretty involved. With the I, two think, I think this is a, as a long term. Yeah, it's going to take a little while. It's going to take some back yeah. and forth. I think it will. It's addressing an issue that we have. In the code and really well. And but I would like to see us keep plowing yes. along because yeah. along. the longer you not get it done, the right. people mm -hmm. can't take advantage of it. And I might like to see if there's anybody out there in the community that might want to, you know, help work on this a little bit. That would be great too. Um, I mean, the, you know, a lot of. We may have to to so I would, right. the, yeah. a lot of, yeah. right. a yeah. lot of yeah. work on this um, about this kind of thing was done at the Charette. I think they talked a lot about, you know, cottage. For the uh, Antioch? Right. Yeah, the yeah. Antioch Charette. Um, so there might be, like, I mean, they put out so much uh, really great, I mean, I was there like all seven days. Um, and, um, you know, they had extremely experienced, very knowledgeable architects working on all different kinds of projects, um, you know. And so looking into what they came up with um, regarding this kind of thing might be interesting. I, you want me to do that? That'd be great. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're working on coming forward to, to us, the yeah. commission on a co-housing project, yes. which is a little bit different. Yeah. It's different. But yeah, I'll see what they okay. came up with. Sounds good, thank you very much. Okay, is this, are we still on television? Yeah. Okay, um, is there any more items before Planning Commission? Uh, if not, can I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah.